I'm Brian Atkinson and welcome once again to UK Aircraft Explored. Before I begin, I'd just like to say a big thank you to everyone who subscribed and regularly watched my channel. I also appreciate and enjoy reading your comments. Remember, your support is very much appreciated. After an amazing surge of views for my video covering the FN64 mid-lower gun turret, the question often came up about the radial engine powered Lancaster and whether it actually existed. It most certainly did, so I decided to put together this detailed video covering the Avro Lancaster B Mark II. As always we shall be referring to wartime air ministry manuals. I hope you find this interesting. In total, some 7,300 Avro Lancasters were built with the Rolls-Royce Merlin inline liquid cooled engine. An additional 300 were built, however, with the Bristol Hercules radial air-cooled Mark VI and 14 engines. This variant was the Lancaster B Mark II. It was built as a safety net to ensure that if there was a supply shortage of Merlin engines due to enemy action or any other reason, there would be a version of the Lancaster that could continue to operate with an alternative source of power. With the Merlin powered Lancaster Mark I completed and now in production, A.V. Rowe's experimental department quickly handmade the first Lancaster Mark II, mainly from existing airframe parts at their Chatterton factory in Manchester. The prototype Lancaster Mark II was given the serial number DT810 and first flew on November 26, 1941 from Ringway. In February 1942, DT810 was flown to the Aeroplane and Armament Experimental Establishment at Boscombe Down in Wiltshire for its official type tests. These tests proved very promising. Whilst this was happening, the Coventry-based Armstrong Whitworth factory was busy tooling up in readiness for the start of the Lancaster Mark II production. The one problem that Sir W.G. Armstrong Whitworth Aircraft Limited faced was that they were still producing the Whitley medium bomber for work in RAF Coastal Command against the U-boat threat. It was not until March of 1942 that the Ministry of Aircraft Production finally agreed that Whitley production should cease and Lancaster Mark II production should begin. The first Avro Type 683 Lancaster Mark II production batch was for 200 aircraft and was built at Whitley in Coventry. Aircraft serials range from DS601 to DS627 and were powered by the Bristol Hercules Mark VI radial engines. All remaining production of this batch were fitted with the Bristol Hercules Mark XIV engine. Deliveries commenced during September 1942 and completed during October 1943, giving an average production of four aircraft per week. A second production batch of 100 aircraft with serials beginning with LL, were all powered by the later Bristol Hercules 14 engines. Deliveries began in October 1943 and completed in March 1944. Production was again four aircraft per week. The limited production of only 300 Langster Mark IIs was due in part to growing Merlin engine production by Packard in the United States planned to meet the production of the Lancaster B Mark III program. Because of this, the threat to Merlin production was now greatly reduced. Armstrong Whitworth completed its first two Lancaster Mark IIs, DS601 and DS602, in September 1942. And these aircraft, along with DS606, flew to Boscombe Down for trials. All other early production Mark IIs except for DS611 were flown to RAF Syston in Nottingham where No. 61 Squadron served as a service trials unit for the Mark II Lancaster. 61 Squadron had been operating the Lancaster Mark I since April 1942 
being the fourth squadron to operate this type. A sea flight was temporarily set up to introduce the Mark II and to assess its abilities in relation to the Lancaster Mark I. Their first Lancaster Mark II, DS-605, arrived during October 1942, with eight other aircraft arriving at intervals until the end of January 1943. After a series of cross-country flights, crews became familiar with the new version, and the Mark II was gradually introduced to operations. Two were detailed to fly with the squadron's standard Lancaster Mark Ones on a bombing raid on the Krupps Works at Essen on the night of January 11-12, 1943. Their participation was seen as a dismal failure. For that raid, 22,000 feet was the recommended height for approaching the target and make use of cloud cover. Neither of the two Lancaster Mark IIs could make this height. DS-810 was unable to rise above 14,000 feet and DS-607 18,400 feet. In the following raids with 61 Squadron, the Hercules Mark VI powered Lancasters were proved to not have the power to reach the required heights as those obtained by Merlin powered Lancaster Mark Ones. At the end of February 1943, the Lancaster Mark II took part in their last operation with 61 Squadron, a bombing raid on Lorient in France. All the remaining Lancaster Mark IIs left 61 Squadron and arrived at the RAF's first dedicated Lancaster Mark II Squadron, number 115, who were based at East Retham in Norfolk. The squadron was part of number 3 group and the squadron code was KO. The squadron had been operating Vickers Armstrong Wellingtons, which had radial engines, and this helped the ground crews adapt to the new Hercules-powered Lancaster. The first 26 Lancaster Mark IIs, up to and including DS-626, were fitted with the Bristol Hercules Mark VI engines, but all subsequent aircraft were initially fitted with the new Hercules Mark XIV engine. This new Mark which was introduced in April 1943, featured a Hobson Master Control Carburetor of type AIT-132ME Carburetor, which, unlike earlier marks, had an entirely automatic regulation of mixture strength. This also meant that Lancasters with the Mark 14 engine no longer had mixture selection controls in the cockpit. It was a general rule that the engines fitted in the Lancaster Mark II must have Hercules engines of the same mark, so Hercules 14 engines could not be mixed with the Mark VI engine. Although inferior in performance, some crews in No. 115 Squadron thought that the Lancaster Mark II were safer than the Merlin-powered Lancaster versions with their vulnerable engine cooling systems. In spite of damage considered crippling to the standard Lancasters, the Mark II struggled back to base. The only squadron ever to form with the Lancaster Mark II was number 514. Officially, this squadron formed on September 1, 1943, at RAF Folsham in Norfolk. Being part of three group, the squadron moved to RAF Waterbeach in November of that same year. Whilst we are covering squadrons, the Royal Canadian Air Force also operated the Lancaster Mark II in three of their six group bomber units. In June 1943, number 426 Thunderbird Squadron received their Lancaster Mark IIs at RAF Linton on Ouse in North Yorkshire. Number 426 converted to the Handley Page Halifax in May of 1944 after Lancaster Mark II production had stopped. Number 408 Goose Squadron were operating the Halifax when the unit moved to RAF Linton on Ouse in October 1943 to receive their Lancaster Mark IIs. Finally, Number 432 Leeside Squadron moved to East Moor in North Yorkshire to convert from Wellingtons to the Lancaster Mark II in October of 1943. 
Number 432 started operations with their Lancaster Mark IIs on the night of November the 18th, 1943. On February the 3rd, 1944, authority was given to convert Number 432 to the Halifax Mark III, and in six days all Lancasters were flown out, and replacement Halifaxes took over the station. Why were the Lancaster Mark IIs withdrawn? The official Air Ministry view was that the Halifax Mark III, with the same Bristol Hercules Mark XIV engines, could carry out all that the Lancaster Mark II could, and in the interest of type standardisation, the Lancaster Mark II would be phased out. We shall now look at the Lancaster Mark II in more detail. The Lancaster Mark II was fitted with four Bristol Hercules Mark VI and then the improved Mark XIV power plants. The Hercules engine is a 14-cylinder, two-row radial aircraft engine fitted with a two-speed supercharger and driving rotor electric constant-speed propellers. Originally designed by Sir Roy Fedden, and produced by the Bristol Engine Company during 1939, a total of over 57,400 Hercules engines were built. It was the most numerous of Bristol's single-sleeve valve designs, powering many aircraft during World War II, including the Bristol Bowfighter and the Handy Page Halifax Bomber. The Hercules design incorporated a modular engine installation which became known as the Power Egg, which allowed the complete engine and cowling assembly to be removed and changed as a unit. One feature used on all Hercules engines was the exhaust manifold ring that was fitted to the leading edge of the cowling. Here we have a diagram showing the inboard cowling. And here the outboard cowling. Also, here is an Avro drawing showing the outboard nacelle that I've reworked in colour. So what were the differences between the Lancaster Mark I and Mark II in the cockpit? If we look at the Lancaster Mark I instrument panel, we see at the lower right of the panel the four propeller feathering buttons and fire extinguisher buttons. In the Lancaster Mark II, you can see that this panel is changed to include the propeller selector switches, the propeller feathering switches, and below that the four fire extinguisher buttons. If we move on to the starboard side of the cockpit, in the Lancaster Mark I and III, you can see the standard flight engineer's panel. In the Mark III only, a radiator shutter switches panel was fitted to the forward end of the cockpit wall near the instrument panel. In the Lancaster Mark II, the flight engineer's panel doesn't include the coolant temperature gauges, as the radial engines are air-cooled. To the forward end of the cockpit wall, is the pilot's auxiliary panel, as shown here. Here you can see the engine temperature gauges, the propeller safety switches, here are the cowling gill indicators, the cowling gill motors indicator lights, and the cowling gills controls. Here's a view of the cowling gills that are located at the end of the engine cowling. Moving on, a number of Lancaster Mark II aircraft were fitted with the Fraser Nash FN64 mid-lower gun turret. The turret proved to be virtually useless in defence against attacking enemy fighters at night, as the gunner had very poor visibility through the periscopic sighting system. If you'd like to learn more about the FN64, you can watch my detailed video covering this unique gun turret. In the meantime, 
Here are some views of the FN64 that was fitted to a Langster Mark I in Canada. Some Langster Mark IIs were also fitted with bulged Bombay doors. The aft end of the doors met up with a fairing that tapered up to the location of the FN64 gun turret, as shown here. The bulged Bombay doors allowed the Langster Mark II to carry the 8,000 pound bomb, along with six 1,000 pound bombs. Here's a diagram showing the crutching of the 8,000 pound bomb, along with details of the bomb slip. Whilst the Langster Mark II could carry a total of 14,000 pounds of bombs, the Merlin-powered Langster Mark I's could carry up to 18,000 pounds of bombs. So by the end of 1943, it was decided that Langster Mark II should be phased out. Armstrong Whitworth had now converted to production of the Merlin-powered Mark I. By D-Day 6th of June 1944, only two squadrons, number 514 and 408, were still operating the Langster Mark II. All other squadrons had moved to either Langster Mark I and III's or the Handy Page Halifax Mark III. Only one Langster Mark II, LL735, was used as a flying engine testbed. Being used to test the Metrovic F2 Oblique 4 Beryl jet engine in the Langster's tail during 1944. The Beryl had an advanced 10 stage compressor and annular combustion chamber. Once testing was complete, the engine was fitted in the new Saunders Row SRA1 flying boat fighter, which first flew on the 16th of July 1947. LL735, the last of the Lancaster Mark IIs, was finally withdrawn from service in 1950 and scrapped, the last of the radial powered Lancasters. Well that's it for this video, I hope you found it interesting. If you like what I do on this channel, please click the like button and please subscribe, and also click the bell. Remember it's free and you'll receive notifications when my future videos are posted. Thanks as always for watching, and I'll see you again next time. Bye for now.